everyone. Um, welcome to the talk from text to context. Um, a very picky title from Angskar. So yeah, um, basically we are here from uh, talking about experience at Get Your Guide, where we introduce hybrid search. Um, and we'll go into details about the problem, why we did it. Um, but the talk is more around how we did it um, and how the experimentation and iteration setup was there for us to kind of um, make that make uh, make it a success. So, uh, without further ado, I'll go into um, next slides and also kind of introduce ourselves. Um, the first one is me. Uh, I'm an engineer at Get Your Guide, a backend engineer. Um, and with me, it's uh, Alex, uh, Angskar, and Ryan, uh, who is not here with us um, for the stock. Um, and uh, but yeah, we we four four of us were part of the group that made this uh, a possibility, uh, the hybrid search uh, at Get Your Guide. Um, and yeah, so moving on, um, Get Your Guide. I'll just give a quick quick brief intro, uh, introduction. Um, basically, we um, we have an experience platform, uh, something that you could just book your experiences on wherever you go. Um, and that's something that we provide as uh, for the customers. So uh, here are some numbers, some impressive numbers. Um, uh, we have 800 plus employees. We are hiring, by the way. So <laughs> uh, the problem, um, OK, so now going into the actual um, part of the talk. Um, basically, if you can, like just going back to the problem statement itself, there's a clear outcome that we are going to kind of show first. Before um, venturing into this problem, what you can see that some of the, one of the one of the um, uh, one of the actual user query didn't result into any results, even though we actually have those activities that people would want to do in Edinburgh with their family, uh, we're still not showing it. So that's a that's a potential customer bounce, right? Um, and hence we embarked on the journey to. And this is one of the examples, and we were embarked on the journey to improve it, and the outcome was basically on the right, as you can see. Another just example is, um, again, a bit of more complex queries doesn't result into um, any good results for the customers. So something that, um, yeah, you can see on the right, the, the results are essentially better and kind of match the context of the query that the user is passing. Um, now moving on to the exact implementation and like understanding of what hybrid search is, um, Angsgar will take take it forward from here. Okay, thank you. Ah, microphone works great. Um, maybe also worth to mention with the examples that we already saw is the differentiation between if there's a location included in the query or not, because that's quite important for us and uh, keep that in mind for the rest of the talk. Um, before I introduce hybrid search, maybe I just ask uh, who of you here knows what hybrid search is? Yeah, I expected that, like you couldn't avoid it in this conference. Um, who, who has a hybrid search system running live? Okay, already quite some people, so maybe you have experiences like us or similar. Um, still, I wanted to briefly introduce um, what it means, like maybe there are a few people who haven't uh, heard about it and yeah, so on the one hand, we have this traditional keyword search approach, which is based on uh, frequencies. So if a word like here, the pizza from the query appears more often in the document, that's a higher score in the term frequency. If it appears in few other documents, it's also a good thing. So it's in a higher uh, inverse document frequency. And um, this was improved to BM25 score. Uh, by also considering the length of the document. Um, in hybrid search, this is combined with vector search. Um, also, you cannot avoid it here at the conference. Uh, just one example in our context, like the uh, query could be Pizza New York. And um, yeah, so the query is uh, converted into a vector by the um, semantic search model. On the other hand, all the documents are converted into vectors, and then the vector search basically gives the results where the vectors are closest to the query vector. 
And in this case, it would be the NYC pizza walking tour, and maybe you also want to include the New York City food tour. Um, interesting part is, and um, what's also considered the best um, results, what, um, yeah, you heard about it before, um, is to combine the two approaches. So you run basically both approaches in parallel, uh, the query um, goes to the vector search and it goes to the keyword search. Um, upper considers the frequency, lower the vectors. And then in the end, you have to combine the results of both approaches. Uh, and there, I think uh, it gets interesting because there are multiple ways how you could combine the both approaches. And the question is, what is the best here? So, um, I would say one family of how to combine it is to combine the scores of the approaches. A similar, uh, uh, pretty simple way is to try to find a linear combination. Um, so, you take the BM25 score from the keyword approach, the cosine similarity from the vector approach, and um, what was also important for us, and I think for most uh, product searches, is to also include a kind of product popularity, or in the case of documents, a document popularity, so that still things that are not very popular at all, they are not ranked very high up. And then, uh, yeah, the final constant here, the intercept, so um, if you want to just show everything, let's say, where the score is above zero, then that's also important. Um, that's the way that we started, because it, um, it's simple enough to just try it out, and it's uh, produced good enough results. It has a downside of, um, yeah, that it's linear. So maybe you have um, distributions of these BM25 and cosine similarity scores where a linear approach doesn't really work on combining them. Um, for that, you could use another simple approach, that's reciprocal rank fusion, so you basically don't look at the input scores, but just at the position that you have in both systems, and then you combine those positions. Um, the best way to go forward, I would say, is to, um, yeah, to, to train another model on top, which really learns how to combine these two scores and also the product score uh, in a learn-to-rank model. Um, a bit different family of how to combine both approaches is hierarchical. So uh, many people start with a keyword search and then they just use the vectors for re-ranking on top and then maybe for even the, the very uh, top results, they even use a, a slow cross encoder. Um, other things we've, saw, uh, we've seen is that vector search is only applied to a subset of queries for more complex queries. And actually, we will get to it, we also use this, this approach uh, in, a, yeah, in a way. You will see it. Okay, so that was the introduction again of hybrid search. And next we talk about the architecture that we had and that we now have for the hybrid search. And uh, there Alex will present. Right, that's a lot of people. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, in this section, I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the architectural details of the system we came up with um, at the time of implementing. So, um, and to help you navigate a little bit, I'll start off with giving like this small glimpse into our stack that is relevant specifically to the problem at hand. So on the infrastructure side, we use Kubernetes to um, to run our services. Uh, we run daily jobs in a Databricks uh, cluster, and we schedule them via Airflow. And lastly, we use Kafka um, as our go-to data bus of choice. 
everything we have uh, is pretty much implemented in, this, in Python and in Java. Uh, for example, search is implemented in Java, and most of the ML applications and services are written in Python. Uh, on the databases side, we use OpenSearch and Postgres, mostly to persist and access data in web applications that we have. And on top of OpenSearch, uh, specifically for this use case, we use the KNN plugin. It powers our approximate nearest neighbor search since, uh, since this plugin supports a few popular ANN implementations such as Faiz, NMSleep, and Lucene. Um, yeah, and finally, I'll just briefly touch upon some of the core frameworks we're using. We have Spring Boot that powers our um, Java web services. We have FastAPI as our framework of choice for Python applications. We use MLflow um, as the model registry of choice. And then we have Sense Transformers as sort of a wrapper around language models and on an X on top of it to um, efficiently serve it. So now on this slide, um, I've got sort of a bird's eye overview of the system we built. Um, the overall flow is as follows. Uh, the search service uh, received a full text query from, from the search bar that you, that you can see on the left. Um, this uh, query may or may not have the location in it, and based on that, uh, we give location-based query a little bit of a special treatment, but we'll expand on it a little bit later. So once we get this query um, in the search API, we pass it over to the inference service up top. Um, it does its job and returns the embedding along with something that we call model ID and a few other parameters that we use back to search. Search then uh, collects it and turns it essentially into a database query. Um, and once that query uh, is done doing its thing, we finally take the semantic score, the BM25 score, and the uh, sort of the business score that we have and combine them in a linear fashion. And then we return it back, back to the client. Then um, down there, you can see this uh, search async processor, it's kind of the uh, asynchronous background job that we have that just picks uh, the catalog of activities on, on a daily basis, embeds it and deliver, del delivers it over to uh, open search via the Kafka bus. Um, so among the challenges we had in mind before jumping into implementing this whole thing were uh, the end-to-end -end latency, it must be below certain threshold that we had in mind at P95, and then as the system is managed by a data science team and a backend team, we wanted the data science team to be able to experiment independently. And to reduce team dependency and overhead here, we implemented dynamically generated vector fields in OpenSearch via dynamic templates. Uh, so the field is created on the fly um, per model ID. So if let's say today we start injecting vectors produced by a model ID, by a model that has a new model ID, um, um, yeah, the, the, the field is going to be created automatically. And then at request time, if we're doing experimentation, say we might toss a coin and based on the outcome, select the model ID we want to serve and we pass it back in the response so that search knows which field to use for similarity searching. And the next important thing here uh, is the hybrid query that we implemented. Essentially, we use the same index to store activity data and and vectors so that at runtime we do only one query instead of two, thus making only one round trip to the database. So next we'll zoom in a bit into the inference service uh, that, that we had. Um, yeah, the green, the green block. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <coughs> 
Yeah, so it, it's a pretty simple uh, Python web application. Um, on each deployment, it, uh, it picks the fresh model from, from MammalFlow. Um, it compiles it into an index format and just starts serving. Um, there we have uh, your usual steps, some preprocessing going on. You can think of tokenizing and the inference itself. Uh, but there's also this uh, location question mark block. That's where we check whether or not the query contained a, a known location, known to us location at least, um, and selects uh, sort of a different set of uh, ranking parameters that we pass back uh, to search. Uh, we serve the model itself uh, on CPU, hence uh, during implementation we were somewhat selective. We ran a series of load tests uh, using different, um, different configurations and models with less and more parameters. And this way, we sort of found the sweet spot we're happy with in terms of both offline metrics and end-to-end -end latency, and then eventually online metrics. Um, and just on the side note, we ended up using um, ONNX to serve the model uh, as in the load testing fa phase, we gathered metrics and observed just better, uh, better CPU utilization. Uh, currently, this, this service is running at roughly 10 milliseconds at P95. So and the last thing I wanted to talk about here just briefly, uh, just to give you an idea of how the offline encoding job looks like, uh, there's, there's nothing really overly special. Uh, this job is scheduled by Airflow. We collect and prepare some data. We fine tune um, the model on Get Your Guy specific data. We save, store the model in MLflow, uh, and then we use it later on to, to encode the catalog and publish, uh, publish the encodings via Kafka um, for search to process and inject it into OpenSearch. Uh, that's more or less it on the uh, technical side, and here I'll pass it over to Ansgar. I think so. Yes, yeah. so now we talk about um, how did we train and evaluate a model for um, hybrid search. And uh, let me switch. So um, the, the first question we had to ask ourselves, like, what do we use for evaluation and training data? And there we had a challenge because, um, yeah, at, at Get Your Guide, um, we had this search copy in the search bar which just says, where do you go? So the uh, users just typed mainly locations. And in this step, we wanted to go away from locations but have uh, also some topics included, like, like the pizza in the example before, or family friendly. Um, so what we did is to, we used a workaround and we used data from our paid search. Um, there you have these keywords that uh, we use for Google bidding and they already have mostly the structure of a location plus something else like, for example, pizza tour to, to New York. And then we needed to know what are good examples for this query and there we looked at the product performance of the, uh, our products on the landing pages uh, where the users then arrived. And um, yeah, we used that for evaluation and also for training. And we had to use some additional simple uh, negative examples because on the landing pages you only have products of the right location and also we ha uh, of the right category mostly. So we also wanted to have some a bit uh, uh, more simpler negatives included. Um, then we ev evaluated the model's um, output, the, the ranking, via NDCG, normalized discounted cumulative gain. And that way we decided like which model is good enough to go. Um, actually, when I talk about model, in, in our case, we had to train and evaluate two models. Like the one is the obvious one that we needed to train a semantic search model which um, converts the query into a vector and the products into vectors. But we also um, 
had to train this combination, so the, the, the linear regression on how to combine the two. Um, and yeah, there, as I said before, we took the vector similarity, BM25 score and the product score, and uh, converted it into an output score. Um, another question that we were facing at the beginning is which semantic search models should we start with? And um, there we took a look at leaderboards, and I think I can recommend this MTEB leaderboard for retrieval because it seems to be um, yeah, up to date. I always see new things popping up on top, while the SBIRT leaderboard, it seems a bit outdated because it's uh, still looking the same. Um, okay. Um, yeah, now I want to show you a small part of the results that we saw in our offline evaluation. It's, it's just a, a piece, but I think it's uh, showing some interesting messages. So, um, the best results we saw by, um, yeah, by large models, like here this uh, E5 large model was the best overall, and it was fine-tuned on our data and uh, used also the, the BM25, so this keyword score. But interestingly, the OpenAI vectors, just from the OpenAI API, uh, they were almost as good, they were a bit worse, but almost as good, and that's without any fine tuning. Um, but, but both of that we couldn't really use because we had uh, concerns about the latency and it would have been too slow. So what we then chose in the end is this uh, uh, smaller version of the E5 model and it's uh, multilingual. So we were able to directly work not only with English, um, queries, but with all of our languages, or most of our languages. Um, maybe what is also interesting to me about specifically this E5 model is that it's not symmetric. So even when it's pre-trained, it's, uh, it's trained differently for the query and for the, um, it's called passage there, so for the document text. And um, you can also do that in the fine-tuning part. Um, so I think that's an advantage of that model. Um, the, the, the other rows here in the table I put in so that you could see um, yeah, some other learnings from the training. So there's the, um, um, this row, compared row four to row six, like these here, they are the same model but here we didn't do the fine-tuning, so it shows that fine-tuning on our data really helped. Then here this all mini-LM I put in because it's a pretty standard model for semantic search, so it performed less than the model that we chose in the end. And um, finally, this, this last row you can compare to the one that we chose. Um, and here you see then the impact of the BM25 score. So if we didn't include the keyword search also in, already in the offline evaluation, we would have seen worse results. Okay. So, ah yeah, I wanted to present some additional findings from this learning that were uh, from this offline evaluation that didn't fit into the, the table. Um, one thing is um, these scores, they were based on uh, English language, but the findings carry over to m multilingual. We also did that, uh, evaluate that, and that carries over. Another thing is that, um, so I didn't have a, a own, um, own column for that part, but including the product score also was quite important to really get a good NDCG. And finally, maybe a bit more detailed, but we also tried uh, with training this model, we tried different losses, and for us, the uh, multiple negatives ranking loss it was performing slightly better than cosine similarity loss. So that are the learnings from offline evaluation, and then we were ready to finally go to live results. And uh, yeah, while looking at live results, sometimes we felt like this little, uh, young sorcerer there. But 
in the end it turns out to be good. So let's see what were our live results. Before we went into experiments, we checked how does it actually look to us. So we, we trained on this data, we evaluated, but it was more numbers and how does it really look to us. So we did some eyeballing and yeah, um, I think you know this is important and uh, we, we actually detected some problems in the eyeballing phase and um, it looks like it's due to having used training data which is not really search training data. Um, one thing we saw is that the product score seemed to be a bit too important in the final weighting. So there were results on top which were popular overall but didn't really fit the query too well. And um, also if we had a query without location, let's say just family friendly without um, Berlin or let's say just pizza without New York included, then um, our cutoff was too, um, too low because um, we trained with location included and then the vector similarity is closer because the location is included on both sides. So we unfortunately had to do some manual adjustments to the process. Uh, but then we were finally ready to test in experiments and uh, we did three A-B tests. The, the first one, we had to stop pretty quickly because we saw in the results it didn't look quite well. And um, there we quickly found a problem with this pure location query. So if it's just Berlin in the query, um, we have a system which detects the location, which extracts the location ID and then filters for it. And that we kept in place also for our hybrid search. But what happened now is that this Berlin was also uh, translated into a vector. And so basically there were filters two times for Berlin, one with this allocation ID and one with a vector, and then we had not enough um, results shown. So solution was easy. We just didn't use um, our system for pure location queries because the existing one was already good enough. Um, then in the second iteration, we saw that there were too many empty results for specific cases. So we, we um, had to adjust thresholds for specific cases. So it was also depending on the, whether location is included. But then we also had already before a system which tries a retry if there's an empty result. And for that, we also had to um, decrease the thresholds. But then um, even the second iteration looked already positive overall. We just wanted to improve further and then um, we were ready to roll out. So the, the third experiment was very positive, was uh, very positive in users clicking and also the revenue part was positive. So we rolled this one out and that's what we're talking about today. Um, still there's a lot to improve, and that's one part of what Darin will be talk about now. Um, yay, revenue. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had a lot of learnings, um, of course. Uh, and as you can see, the team setup as well uh, was not the standard setup that we have at Get Your Guide overall. So I'll just talk about it. Yep, the first one being, um, we had a mix of people, people who can kind of make decisions faster, and so we were able to iterate much faster. So it's really important to kind of, it was really important for us to iterate faster. Uh, as you can see, we had three A-B tests um, before in the previous slide. Um, yeah, again, on going back to the same point, essentially we were able to iterate quickly because of the decision making being faster. Um, uh, so it was uh, essentially eyeballing, uh, kind of looking into the uh, kind of the data itself, looking into the results, and kind of fi figuring out for ourselves what exactly is working and what's not, and then again iterating um, on top of it. Um, the other aspect was, um, and parallelly something that um, uh, we we were running as an experiment was instead of asking customers to the location, they were, where they want to go, um, we allow for customers to kind of put in uh, more complex queries. So, so that can help um, 
capture more data for us, as well as um, people can kind of use their customers can kind of have um, complex queries and get the results for them. Um, so it was an independent but a simultaneous experiment running and kind of helped uh, our experiment as well. Um, to improve, um, yeah, there's nothing on the slide. We are really good. Um, <laughs> oh, no, wait, there is. So, yeah, the one other aspect that Angsgar talked about is um, cutoff decision. And um, within the three A-B tests, we found out that was our primarily something that we required to iterate much, uh, multiple times. Um, and that's where we all still want to improve further, kind of figuring out what's the optimal um, parameters for ranking and, and kind of cutoff thresholds that we have. Um, yeah, train better LTR uh, model on top so we can kind of have um, a re-ranking on top of the existing results or existing re-ranking that we have that would cut off um, the results that have a bigger difference in terms of the scores or vector similarities. Um, that's one approach that we are considering. Um, and um, yeah, sorry, before that, moving on, like one thing that we, we couldn't find out in with open search is that we were not able to get a kind of independent scores of each aspect, like BM25 independently as well as um, similarity scores, um, and something that we have actually pushed as an upstream change in open search um, to allow for getting that. Um, it's gonna be out soon in a few next versions, I believe, and that's gonna help us with uh, better ranking, re-ranking on top. Um, yeah, um, improved training data, as I said, like we had some, some ways to capture data, but we didn't have enough data earlier getting into the project, so something that um, the search co copy experiment is also going to help us. And when we have enough data, we'll also use that to kind of fine tune our models better. Um, other aspect is, um, as we also spoke about uh, location extraction, um, something that those kind of exact matches that we can able, we are able to figure out or extract, um, that's something that um, will allow for more accurate results uh, going forward and something that's already ongoing as a, a project uh, at GetYourCride. Right? Um, and yeah, more fuzziness type of tolerance for customers who just uh, might miss um, a spelling here or there. Um, and location extractions uh, as filters. Um, the, on the technical side, one thing that we want to kind of improve is um, memory footprint. So with quantization, uh, open search currently, the current version of open search that we use, it doesn't allow for integer, um, integer uh, vectors. So, so something that we want to kind of work on and get our memory footprint lower um, by using uh, FV16 or int8 uh, vectors. And I believe we are gonna get it in the next version that we're gonna use. So that's something that we are also looking forward to. Um, and uh, auto-suggest is another aspect of search that we have a, quite a, a big focus on. Um, so as part of um, kind of letting customers search for what they need and giving out the best results, um, that is another aspect that we want to kind of improve and um, allow for customers to have more complex queries and we just deliver what their query is. And something is also which is ongoing right now as I speak. Um, that's it. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions. Very nice. I enjoyed that. Um, learned some things. Uh, so one thing I noticed was that you take Vector is sort of the baseline, and you, there was the one case where you didn't do BM25 in addition. Did you check BM25 alone without Vector? Um, and how bad was that? But the other thing is that people talk about BM25 as though it's a standard algorithm, but it's a standard algorithm for one field. It doesn't tell you what you do with multiple fields. It doesn't do, tell you whether you're using any other tricks like uh, um, shingling or any of the, you know, the, the hundreds of tricks that the field has developed over the past 40 years. So how much effort have you put into the BM25 side of your search? And in a sort of related question, how much have you discovered about what you need to do through the eyeballing, which I thought was a really interesting point that you 
Uh, I always hate it when people have this sort of black box to say, we're just going to adjust the parameters and see what the NDCG looks like. Eyeballing, I'm sure you learned a lot about uh, what things look like from that. Um, yes, so the, the first question, like how did BM25 perform on its own? Uh, I'm, I'm sure we tried that. I don't fully remember it, but I'm also sure it wasn't that good. So, uh, yeah, but I don't have a, a score for that. Um, then how much did we try to um, improve the um, just the BM25 side of things? So um, I think our search has evolved over time. So um, I think there were quite some improvements that we tried. So I, I know that there are, for example, the locations I said is very important for us. So there are location aliases that we put in and things like that. Um, but yeah, because I'm the data scientist in this project for that side, maybe our search engineer knows a bit. <laughs> um, an aspect of BM25, yeah, we had some fine tuning in open search itself. Uh, with some parameters that it allows, um, and we were trying out some results. Um, it didn't cater to some complex queries that we were basically looking forward to have for our, for our customers, and which is why we had to kind of uh, rethink a solution, and hybrid approach seems the best of both worlds kind of a situation for us. So um, yeah, we did have, even, even before this endeavor, we had previous experiments um, with only BM25, and in fact, it works really well just not for all the cases that we want our, um, from a customer's behavior point of view that we have uh, looking forward to. So um, yeah, if that answers your question. Oh. Uh, there was. I, I guess, uh, well, let someone else ask. <laughs> uh, but I remember there was another uh, part of the question, like how much did you do about, uh, with this eyeballing? Yeah, and um, yeah, uh, my ideal, situation would have been that with eyeballing, we just confirm that everything is fine, but as, <laughs> as, I, uh, well, as we presented here, uh, we really had to do some adjustments, and I hope that, that uh, it gets better if we really use the training data from our search, because then uh, yeah, it, it uh, should train better for the situation that we're really using it. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Maybe? No? Sure. <laughs> right. Um, so you're doing re-ranking in LTR. Have you looked at systematically tuning before the search, so tuning the parameters of the search using grid or, or whatever uh, approach? Mm, I didn't understand fully. So. so uh, I think it was last year or the year before Doug Turnbull, I believe, gave a talk where he was talking about automating the tuning of the parameters of the search, like the mix ah. of, of, semant of vector versus uh, BM25 or the weight of different fields or how much boost you give to popularity, you know, mm. all this sort of thing you can do before the search, which is much more efficient than doing it by re-ranking, if you can do it. Um, Right, because you don't have to throw away results, essentially. So I wonder if you've, you've been exploring that approach at all. I think for the existing system, there was like a optimization process, which was, I think, more manual. Um, yeah, for, for this first attempt that we did, we, we just tried to learn this uh, coefficients from the linear regression. Um, so yeah, that's all that we did. And um, now we putting the results from this system for the final ranking into a, um, our ranking system. We have a, our own ranking system. Um, we were first afraid to use it directly because uh, of latency, but it seems to be good enough now. And um, yeah, there, Actually, another team is responsible for it, and they are more the specialists on, on optimizing for, for that part. So that's um, done on their end. Okay. Hmm. The, uh, organizational structure <laughs> you could say that. Yeah. But yeah, there was some thought put into uh, the decision to put it into an own team. Actually, yeah, 
the, the team that would have been responsible for both would have grown too big. So I think there are also upsides of splitting it. All right. Thanks, Ansgar. Um, thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so sorry. Uh, but you can always pick Ansgar or Darin or Alex Brains outside uh, while we prepare for the next speakers. Uh, yeah, thanks for your keen attention, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. As well. Thank you.